Yeah, I mean, it certainly helped me. Uh, and obviously, it's something you probably would do if you've just come out of a relationship. You you want to change yourself. You want to have this new life can dictate the fact that you're going to have a new look. You're going to change your wardrobe. You're going to change your hair. So it certainly did help in terms of me being able to follow the two Helens, because otherwise I think I would have been very, very confused at times, simply because of this, the way they interweave the two stories and the way, like I said, you know, the the, the way at times you, you glance across and you see the parallel story also happening at exactly the same time. It's not as though they are separate. These two stories do absolutely interweave. Okay, thank you, Ken. Thank you for joining. So today we're going to discuss the movie Sliding Doors. Yeah. And so this is um, a movie that I actually first watched it back in 1999. I actually had a job at a bank and I actually lost a job. And I was kind of really down and out and I went to the video rental store for Ooh, renting a VHS tape. Yes, right? And so I told the clerk I was, you know, what happened and that I was down and out and I needed a pick me up movie. And she suggested this movie. And I really like the the idea of this movie because it's this um the main character, Helen, she actually got fired too. So I'm out. Am I? Um and yes. she leaves her job and she's on her way home and she's about to try to catch the subway or the tube, the tube I guess, right? In London. Yeah. And the doors are about to shut. And in one, then at that point, the movie goes into two different directions. One is if she caught the tube and one yeah. is that she did it. In the, in the storyline where she doesn't catch the tube, she gets home. She ends up having a bit of an accident. Somebody tries to rob her and she ends up going to the hospital. So she gets delayed and she comes home and she finds her, she finds her boyfriend and she tells him that she lost her job. But the storyline where she catches the tube, she ends up sitting next to a really nice guy. They're Beatles lyrics, aren't they? I don't know, sorry. And she gets home on time and in that storyline, she finds her boyfriend in bed with another woman. Who is she? She's Lydia. I did like the way they ran the parallel stories. Um, so, as you say, she she misses one tube. The film literally rewinds. To show her getting onto the tube. Um, and obviously these two stories are now running in parallel and they, they cross over and interchange all the way through the film and show how her life could be if she caught the tube, how it could be if she hadn't caught the tube. It becomes quite complicated. It becomes, you're really having to follow the story very, very carefully to understand at times how these interlinking stories or these parallel stories run together. I mean, as you say, she finds her, her boyfriend in bed with another woman. She obviously leaves, she goes to see a friend, she stays with a friend. At this particular point, she starts a new life. She creates this new life and she has a new hairstyle. And it must be said, this new hairstyle that Helen has was very, very useful in being able to dis differentiate between the two sets of stories running together. As a film, I really enjoyed it. I, I, I thought it was a really nice piece of entertainment. It, it worked. I was engaged all the way through. Um, I saw the film probably about the same time as you, the late the, the late nineties, probably when it was when it was brought out, which I think was about 98, 99. Mm -hmm. So I remember going to see it. But you know, it was just it was a good film, but nothing more than that. And obviously going back 20 odd years later. It was refreshing to rewatch the film, see London in the in the late nineties, see technology in the late nineties, mobile phones in mobile the late nineties, it was huge big. computers in the late nineties. <laughs> right, exactly. The yeah. monitors huge and all that. Um, yeah, I like I like the fact, that, like you said, the hairstyle, the the changing of her hair. She gets it cut drastically and gets it highlighted blonder. So that really helps to kind of tell which Helen's story that you're watching at different times. 
the different things that are happening depending on whether she caught that train or she didn't. So seeing what happened because like one storyline she obviously she loses the job and she's got to get jobs working two jobs working waitressing jobs and she's still with the boyfriend because she doesn't know he's cheating and the other storyline where she leaves the boyfriend she meets the new guy that james the new guy that she met in the tube because she was working in public relations pr so she starts her own pr small company she works a really good opening for a restaurant so you see all these wonderful developments in the new storyline, the new nice boyfriend that's very much different from the old boyfriend and the her starting the PR firm and all that. So you see what happens, what happened if she had caught that train. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing is it's not just two parallel stories. These parallel stories actually intercross because you see at times that her relationship with either the new boyfriend or the old boyfriend, you kind of see the characters at times passing each other. It's very, very well woven together. Like I say, um, it's almost one of those films you have to watch twice, really just to kind of keep a grasp, well, to, to grasp what is actually happening, how these interlinking stories cross and crisscross and recross. They're not... They don't run in parallel, they are crossing all the time and they're bringing the characters almost fit away from each other in various kind of situations. So it is as a storyline, it's more complicated than you think. I mean, when I initially spoke about this, I just said, you know, it's it's a relatively simple story about how people's lives can change in the drop of a hat. But this film really does weave this this web very, very well together. It's, yeah, I mean, I literally, I got to the end of it and thought, I need to rewatch this just to make sure that I haven't missed some of the tiny pieces of detail which are woven in. Um, obviously, you've seen this film quite a few times. It's, it's a, obviously a, a great favourite of yours in those periods potentially when... Life's not going well. It was just my go-to for the different times I got laid off or different things that happened in my life uplifts you or what's the word I'm looking for. You find it as an uplifting film, but also it's kind of, it's very positive. I think it's very positive because it does, the film does say, look, you know, as one door closes, another one opens. Exactly. And, you know, you should never be that down because... The result, there's potentially always something positive. There is always another relationship. There is always another job. There is always another possibility. You may have to wait for it. It obviously does deal with relationships Mm -hmm. and how mind-blowingly complicated relationships can be. Well, actually, both Jerry and James are in other relationships. Jerry, obviously, is two-timing Helen. And... He's in a very difficult situation. I mean, he's a guy who really needs to get his life sorted. James, and we only it's only it's only fractionally alluded to in the film initially. It comes up towards the end of the film. Um, he's he's married. Mm-hmm. Helen finds out that uh, James is married when she goes into his office because there's been a, a little bit of period of time when they haven't met up because prior to that, Helen has kind of had this fleeting exchange with her ex-boyfriend in the street. James has seen this. It's, it's at the, the, the opening of the restaurant. So there's a, there's a period of time when they haven't talked, when they've both been working and the, the, she builds up her courage, she goes to his office and suddenly finds out back from the receptionist that he's married. And there's this little bit, talking about sliding doors, where she walks up to the door or up to the wall and she just stands there. And I just noticed it, it as lovely visual, very subtle. And the, the glass doors are just doing that behind her. And you kind of think, you know, she suddenly, she thought her life was perfect. She thought James was perfect. She thought she was in a situation where this new relationship was so much better than her old relationship, but she just clocked the fact that she doesn't know everything about him. The the, the revelation that he's married 
and again, these these dolls are just doing that, and it's 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 such a subtle image. But I just clocked straight away this this idea of these sliding doors, and she's just standing there for a second, as she's just, what's going on? Why hasn't he told me? Why why has he not been that truthful? Obviously, it's still quite early on in the relationship, but you would have thought that he would have been honest at this particular point because he comes across as a really nice guy. He's been married for three years. He's getting divorced. It's an amicable divorce, but he seems like the nicest guy on earth. He's just, he's so witty. He's just, he he's just so, he's so funny. attentive. He, it's, it's never said as to why he's getting this divorce. But yeah, this, the opening and closing door on the tube, the opening and closing door on the lift, the elevators for you guys. Um, it's used visually throughout the film to, to, to show that, you know, um, you can get into some, you can get out of something uh, in terms of lifts, in terms of tubes, into buildings through these doors and things can change. Just walking through that door or not walking through that door can change your life. Yeah. He's going to visit with his, his wife, that's still his wife, his mother, who's in the hospital. Um, and they keep on the pretense for the mother's sake. And he says yeah. his, his wife is a really wonderful woman, a very sweet person and that she's doing it for him, like keeping up the pretense that things are still good in their relationship. So they seem to have a good relationship. Maybe they just weren't, they found that it wasn't working out for them, but it seems yeah. like... She's really frail, James. Do you want me to postpone my trip? I mean, there's another course later in the year. It's only a couple of weeks, you should go. Keeping up the pretense for his mother and for her caring for him. So like, even though he's getting divorced, it seems like they had a pretty good, a good friendship, I guess I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, th I think the implication is that the mother is dying. Um, that's why she's going into hospital. That's why she's going into, into uh, quite intensive care. Um, so the, the, the relationship is being maintained probably in the, the last, the dying months of the mother's life. It's alluded to, it's not really said, but that's kind of alluded to that. That's why this, that's why they're sort of still visually together on a couple of occasions outside of the hospital because obviously Helen sees him and his wife at the reception or at the, the entrance to the hospital after having found out that he is married but there's there are lots of threads which cross through this film there's the the fact that Jerry who's who's two timing her his American girlfriend gets pregnant, as does Helen. Helen. And it's, yeah, <laughs> there's a massive minefield of, of things happening. And it's, you, you really have to tread, very, or they have to tread very carefully through the plot in, in terms of how this works, because you, you have these two pregnancies and um, within these two parallel stories, Helen, she is she's involved in two let's say accidents where she falls down the stairs where the, where she's run over on the street and you have these again these parallel situations where two helens are going to hospital two helens lose their babies one helen dies this part of the story is where literally i just thought oh why the hell did you do that when helen is in the operating theater and uh, James, her new boyfriend, lover, is with her in the operating theatre as she dies. That would never happen. Please don't insult my intelligence. Why wasn't she in a hospital bed in a ward dying? It doesn't happen in an operating theatre. I'm sorry. It just at that particular point, the film was just like, oh, no, sorry. Sorry. But it, it just, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's that visual thing. For, a, for, for filmmakers to labour these intensely emotional situations and, and really make you want to cry because she's on the operating theatre. She's, she's in her last moments of dying. Where were the nurses? Where were the doctors? The little machines go beep, 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 beep right. Beep, beep. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if I have a criticism about that film, it's that one little scene where I just thought, you've thrown a really nice idea in the bin for me. You, you really could have made that so much better. You could have been so much more real, um, real in terms of her just dying in the ward 
and not in the operating theatre. But that was just, ah, yeah, that was just the one thing I had to pick up on and just, I thought, oh, sorry. At that point too, I almost think like, why was that Helen the one that died and not the other Helen, the one that had, mm. the Helen that started the relationship with James, the nice guy, started the new PR firm, really kind of like, you know, caught that train and had all those new things that were good happen to her. I realized they couldn't keep both stories going on forever. So at one point they had to like bring them back together. Obviously that's explained at the end. Right. When the old Helen leaves hospital and finds or walks into a lift uh, and finds James in the lift. And it's almost a carbon copy of the beginning of the film where she drops an earring and he picks it up. And, you know, there's this, there's this reference to this, this, um, this, this quote from Monty Python, which is, uh, nobody would expect, would expect the Spanish Inquisition. Thank you. Cheer up. You know what the Monty Python boys say? Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's obviously something that James says quite a bit because it's something uh, when he's talking to his mother as um, he's telling his mother that, you know, they're selling the house and she's going to be moving into central London and she's going to be cared for. And uh, she says something like, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. So it's obviously one of his um, uh, used lines. It's used and abused by him all the time, I think. I, I did like the way they brought that film back at the end. So, like I said, it's almost a carbon copy of the orig of the that first meeting in the lift as she's leaving. As you know, is 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 uh, just after she's been fired, um, where they where they first meet before they meet again on the tube. So, like I said, I think there's some lovely, lovely pieces in this film where the plot really does interweave beautifully, um, and like I said, where it actually becomes quite 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 difficult to to follow. As a side note, and this is an interesting one. A friend of mine is a storyboard artist, and he actually worked on this film. And um, he was telling me that uh, quite a lot of, of the, the crew were used as extras, as background artists, and him and his wife were actually used on the bridge, but were cut out. So that, they, they, they ended up on, the, on the, uh, the cutting room floor. But yeah, apparently a lot of the, the smaller extras, background artists, are actually crew, which is, is lovely, because, I mean, I've worked on a lot of very, very low no budget films where everybody gets involved. People are all, you know, constantly recycling people in the background, either the, the, the immediate background or the, or the distant background. And it almost sounds like uh, the director of the film was kind of doing the same thing, using his crew in the background to pad out shots. But I have to come up, I kind of like that because, you know, film shoots are very much a family affair. You really get to know people. Um, and it must be said, the film itself has a, has a very nice production value, but it doesn't have that sh huge um, production bill about it. It doesn't look as a, a massive, massive budget. It looks like a, a relatively well-budgeted British film of the era and generally British films, uh, uh, you know, generally, because the budgets are not as big as the big Hollywood blockbusters. So generally you don't have scenes where there are lots and lots of people. A lot of the scenes are quite simple with just the main protagonists mm -hmm. and a few extras in the background. I think it's probably only um, the, um, the party in the restaurant and a couple of the pub scenes where there are probably more people in the background, which is a little fuller, but you don't have these huge crowds of people. So everything's quite close or quite open in terms of it's just literally the main protagonists. Um, as again, just kind of throwing something in, there's, a, there's some lovely scenes which bring me back in time. Uh, James, sorry, Jerry, Jerry keeps meeting up with one of his friends in a Oh pub. yes, I was gonna bring up, I love this character. There's a lot of smoking which is no longer legal in the UK. And I do remember that era, that period of time, just before they stopped smoking in pubs. But this guy is, 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 is full of, of wisdom and observations. He's great. 
He's great. He's a little bit like the mother in um, Spanglish. Right. He's just yeah. brought, he's just brought in to bring out these real gems of 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 knowledge uh, and observation. He's just dropped in again and again to to really bring uh, Jerry down to earth and to really say, Jerry, you need to sort your life out, Jerry. You're your own worst enemy. And he's just dropped in and some lovely one-liners. I must say, being with you makes the wait for the next episode of Seinfeld much easier to bear. I didn't reckon on things turning out this way. Fair, I mean, it's a very, again, it's a very subtle kind of humour. It's not barrel, raucous humour you get from this film. There are just subtle pieces of humour dropped in. One of the things I want to ask you, obviously, is it's a British film. Uh, and some of the cuss words, some of the swear words, some of the expressions, I pretty much I'm going to assume, are incredibly British. I know you watch British programmes, but on the whole, did you initially struggle with any of the language? Do you remember when you first saw that film? Did you think, I'm not quite sure of everything which is being said? I think I understood everything. And the only cuss word, of course, I got was the the F-bomb that um, Lydia, she does, Lydia. like, there's one point where they're in the hotel in Dorset and she... She drops F form. It's a wonderful, like, little, like, she's like, I'm standing on this train waiting for you. Like, the ex-girlfriend who wants to be the current girlfriend. But that was the only, only cuss word that I totally picked up on. If there were ones that are totally British ones, I would not have picked up on them. Uh, but I did but understand a lot of the, like, lift and, you know, um, mm. tube and those type of things. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there are a few in there, but... I'll refrain from mentioning them, but I think there's a few in there which I, as I understand, are very typically British, just from listening to or watching Americans doing these cultural differences between the UK and the US and them not getting these words. So I'm pretty much assuming that, although they understood they were not the best words to be using, didn't quite understand the absolute context of these words. So. But yeah, there were a few in there. So but, I guess I'll have to I ask mean, you offline as, what words should I not say <laughs> when I go to London? I think as a film, though, it's on the whole, it's an incredibly easy film to watch, language wise. Uh, it, it's again, it's one of those films which I think when we when we've chosen films, it's quite slow. It's not fast cut. The dialogue is very important. The dialogue on the whole is very, very clear. So I think for a non-native English speaking audience, I think it's one of those films which, if they have a reasonable level, they shouldn't struggle with too much. Fingers crossed, in famous yeah. last words. But um, um, certainly a film which, for a foreign audience, their understanding of English is from the American accent will challenge because we have we have an English woman who's American who has a spectacular British accent. I don't know what her parentage is because her name is Welsh. So I'm not, I haven't done any research as to whether her parents are British, British have probably. gone to the States, da, da, da. but her accent is, I could not fault anything. I would not have realised if it wasn't for you telling me that she was American. I didn't actually clock it. I, I thought she was British. But anyway, perfect English accent, Southern, Southern England, RP. We have James, who has a lovely soft Scottish accent, and we have the female friend of Helen, whose name I can't remember, Anna. who is Irish. With Morris, your ruler, in the ascendancy, you will get wiped out in a freak napalming incident, and Helen says bollocks to you. This guy's very good. And I'm going to go Southern Ireland because of the accent. So you have three quite soft accents, but very different accents, I think, which would be a great challenge to those learning English simply because the accents are there, although very mild. I mean, again, I mean, it's one of those things I think if, if I'm looking at this film as a as an educational exercise, as a language exercise, it's just nice to hear these slight variations with slight accents, English speaking accents rather than English accents, so that people are challenged slightly by the accents. It's great that you pointed that out to me because I didn't get that at all I think maybe because they lived in London so like in the storyline they lived in London as you have right so you lose a little bit of that stronger accent like yeah. Anna and James like I knew their accents were a little bit different I'm a prime example of had to moderate my accent but yeah I'm in mean, London's a massive melting pot there are 
communities from all over the world in London. And I think one of the things you, which does happen is your accent does have to mellow so that other people can can follow you. In, in terms of the way the storyline interweaves and in terms of how it how it finishes, did you struggle also to, to follow the threads all the way through? Because, I mean, I did. I know you've seen it several times. So did, did you I mean, struggle? I think to- I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I watched it many times, but the first time I watched it, I did not. Um, I watched it with this idea of like there being the sliding door. She didn't catch this train or and then she did catch a train and how her life like improved in one storyline. And I never really picked up on the fact that her whole like hairstyle or whole look change was maybe also to help the person watching mm. kind of follow which storyline is which. I'm just like, oh, well, it's like this new Helen. So she's just changing yes. things up. She's yes. starting this PR firm and so on. But I think it was probably also a way for the, you know, the director or whatever to say, okay, how are we going to make sure that people know which storyline they're following? Yeah, I mean, it certainly helped me. Uh, and obviously it's something you probably would do if you've just come out of a relationship. You, you want to change yourself you want to have this new life can dictate the fact that you're going to have a new look you're going to change your wardrobe you're going to change your hair so it certainly did help in terms of me being able to follow the two Helens because otherwise I think I would have been very very confused at time simply because of this the way they interweave the two stories and the way like I said you know the 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 way at times you you glance across and you see the parallel story also happening at exactly the same time. It's not as though they are separate. These two stories do absolutely interweave and there are periods of time when one story is crossing directly over to the other story. They're not, they're not separate. So um, I think having the hair change and the image change did help me t- to be able to follow the two Helens and the two stories. Otherwise, I think I would have been lost. Certainly it's a film which I would, I'm probably going to go back to watching again. Normally when we do these film reviews, I do normally watch a film the first time just as a way of just enjoying the film. But the second time I watch it, I normally watch it to kind of pick it apart, pull it apart and to try and uh, see where I think I can make comments or where I can make judgments about the film. So I, I sort of split the film into two sections. One is just enjoy the film for what it is. The other one is to pull it apart, to use it, to, to, to pull it apart and make notes so that when we're chatting about the film, uh, we can make, or I can make, relatively important opinions about what I thought of the film. Um, and I didn't get the chance this time. I only watched it as something, as a piece of one and a half hour entertainment and absolutely as a piece of entertainment. Thoroughly enjoyed it, thoroughly recommend it. It's a chick flick, I think. True. Sure. Um, which is a slightly derogatory term, which is it's it's a film much more designed for women in terms of love stories rather than a war story, which is probably more designed for men. But certainly a very, very enjoyable film uh, and a film which, again, coming back to something I may have said earlier, relatively easy to understand in terms of the language used. So absolutely thumbs up as a brilliant choice of film and uh, thoroughly recommended. What will our next our next film be? What will the choice be, George Troy? Ah, well, I've chosen an Orson Welles film, but it, and it's set post-war Vienna. It's called The Third Man, black and white, with a very recognisable piece of music which runs throughout the film. It made this piece of music very, very popular. Uh, and very interesting in terms of its camera angles and the way it was shot and where it was shot. Um, and my wife, who was in Vienna a couple of years ago, says that even today around the city, there are plaques to this film and the locations where the film was shot. So, yeah, The Third Man, that's my choice um, for our next film. So it's on to Netflix, onto one of your streaming services to get this one, or as I normally do, s- straight onto eBay and find a cheap copy. So what will you be doing? I will be hunting it down on one of the streaming services. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Love every choice that you have suggested. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, looking forward to the next chat and uh, you take care. Thank you very much and appreciate um, the film Sliding Doors. A brilliant choice. All right. Thank you. You too.